heart. When you just quiet yourself, what's the first thing that pops into your heart? You need to pray about that. Or that person that's on your heart, pray for them. Or that worry. Or the care. We open up our eyes, Lord, to see your word is true. Please speak to us. Amen. We're starting a new series today called The Lost Art of Loving. And um, it wasn't too long ago that we were trying to think as a staff, what should we talk about to bring us into fall and um, to equip us to do a better job of reaching our town um, with the love of God. And um, this is what we thought of. And we, um, we as a staff are all reading a book right now about love as well as the Bible. Um, it's good to read the Bible first and another book about what you're reading about in the Bible so that you're getting the Bible straight from the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And then um, it's good to read another book to augment that. And uh, we're all reading a book called Everybody Always by Bob Goff. And um, he is a lawyer that um, became... Um, a philanthropist who would go over to the other side of the ocean and use his lawyer skills to fight for the disadvantaged and for the poor. And um, when he sells the book, he gives all the money to a project in um, Africa where he goes back there. And um, he's just a dude that discovered the love of God for himself. And God's using a lawyer to equip people with the love of Jesus. If that doesn't tell you, God uses the people that we wouldn't expect. That's pretty great. If you're a lawyer here, please forgive me. I'm sure you love the Lord. Um, but, uh, you know, I saw this picture. Um, I was trying to find an image because I'm a visual thinker. And I was thinking about love. And I couldn't think, when I found this picture about the love of God, I couldn't think of a better image. Because um, this series is going to help us learn how to love everybody always, no matter who they are. Loving the people around us, no matter who they are. And that's what this series is about. And that picture is an example of God's love. And um, I was that kid when I was in school, in the black. I was picked on ruthlessly and um, bullied, and I felt that way. And then one day in grade four, when we, it's hard to move, right? When we moved to Edmonton, and I was this new kid, and then they found out my dad was a pastor. That was even worse. And... Um, when I actually had some friends come and do what this little girl's doing for this little boy and offer me friendship and love, it turned my world back up to the right side up. And um, that's what it's like. The Bible says in 1 John 3.16, if you want to know what love is, this is what love is. This is how we know what real love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Pretty simple. Jesus himself said, you could fit the whole Bible, the whole law, into four words. Love God and love people. And he said, it's that simple. Because if you love God, you're going to worship him. You will just automatically have the Ten Commandments down. If you love people, you will automatically have the Ten Commandments down. Because love covers the whole thing. Paul said the only thing that counts in Christianity is faith expressing itself through Love. Now, this might sound surprising coming from a preacher, but I will agree that many of the world's problems come from religion. Because it's people that haven't had their hearts truly changed, they use religion as a tool to control people. And they don't know how to love people, they only know how to get people to obey their religion or their rules. So what happens is that people um, don't feel the love of God when they come to church because... There's just another rule to obey, another thing to do. And that's not what it's about. It's about the love of God. Jesus Christ came to earth, like Ty talked about, to find the lost. Christianity is the only religion where God doesn't want man to get to him with a bunch of rules. It's God coming to man, right? That's the difference. And this is what love is. The Bible says that. And... Um, the guy who wrote that verse, John, also wrote in the next chapter, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love, 
does not know God. Pretty, pretty blatant. Okay? Everyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. He's the source of love in the universe. He is love. So when you want more love, what you're really saying is, I need more of Jesus because he is love, right? He's love come down from heaven. This is how God showed his love among us. John reiterates, he sent his one and only son into the world that we might love through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us, and they see God through us. That's what he's saying. If you want to know what God looks like, look at a person who's so full of him that he just, or she just loves the people around them unconditionally and is solid and patient and kind because that all comes from love. I mean, you want a prayer list for yourself? Here's a good prayer list. Open up 1 Corinthians 13 and put your name in the sentences. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love doesn't get anger, angry quickly, right? Bob is patient. Bob is kind. Bob is not patient. i got to stop at that one. Okay, Lord, start praying. i got to start praying. So that is what he's saying is if someone that's full of the love of God shows you what God's really like, and if they're a religious person that doesn't show you love, they're not from God. It's a pretty simple test. How do we prove who we are? Well, this is a good question. When I was, this is a story that kind of answers this question in a way. I was in Dairy Queen one time with some friends. And you know how you got the tray, right? I put my wallet on the tray. What do you do with the tray when you're done eating? You feed the garbage, right? My dad would say, go feed the garbage, son. So um, one day, this is another story. Mom and dad were in Tim Hortons. He forgot it wasn't in McDonald's. And he said, I just got to feed the garbage. And he dumped all the bowls and the cutlery and the mugs. And they hear this clanking. And dad was like, wrong garbage. Anyway, um, but I, I dumped my wallet in the garbage, right? And didn't realize it till the next day when the garbage was somewhere, my wallet is buried in the Cornell dump. It's been there for 20 years, right? And then what happens when you go down to get new ID, right? So you go to the bank, I need a bank card. Okay, can I have some ID? No, I don't have any ID, right? Well, how do I know you're Bob Evans? I'm like, oh, in this town it would be okay, but Cornell, you know? And then I, I need to get a new driver's license. Okay, I need to see some ID. I haven't got any ID. I'm Bob Evans. Well, I need proof that you're Bob Evans. Okay, I gotta go home, find some mail, right? Come back to the driver's license office. This mail, this is my address. This is my friends vouching for me. You know, it was a real hassle trying to prove who I was, right? And, and Bob Goff asks the question, how do you prove who you really are? And he answers it with, you prove who you really are by how you love people. That's how you prove you're a Christian. Jesus said, They'll know you're Christians by your love, right? And the cross was that. So by love, well, what does love look like? Love looks like Jesus. That's how you prove you're his when you live like him, when you are like him. So to get love, a self-help book probably won't work. Knowing that you need to be patient, you need to be kind, probably isn't enough. You need the source inside you to be patient and kind. So he comes out of you. The Spirit of God comes out and spills onto the lives of other people. You need Jesus. That's how you get love. Because love kicks into high gear when it's needed most. God didn't write us off when we all told him to take a hike. He came after us in the person of Jesus. So love kicks into high gear when it's needed most. So let's say you have four kids like I do. And three of them are being good kids. And one of them, one of my daughters, let's say, moves to Vancouver and gets into a bad scene and gets into such a bad scene that she becomes a streetwalker to make a living. I'm going to pour more love into that daughter and more of my time and more of my prayers into that kid that's struggling than to the three kids that are doing well. Love kicks into high gear when it's needed most. 
And I know a couple that spent every dime they had going to Vancouver looking for their daughter every weekend. All the way from Quinnell where they worked to Vancouver. And our church helped them out with gas so they could look for their girl. Because that's what love does. It kicks into high gear where it's needed most. It's how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us when we got ourselves into a hell-bound spiral going downhill. That's when love kicked into high gear. Because we're his lost kids. And how do you feel when your kid gets lost in his store? That's when you love them the most. You'll go after them. That's what the cross is about. Bob Goff said this. The kind, loving people are the ones that I've spent most of my life loving. Loving the people who are easy to love made me feel like I was really good at it because the people I loved were kind and wonderful. They made sure they told me what a great job I was doing loving them. What I've come to realize, though, is that I was avoiding the people that I didn't understand and the ones who lived differently than me. Here's why. Because some of them creeped me out. And that's why this sermon is called Creepy People. It's, the, it's uh, one of the chapters in his book. And he pointed out this quote. I spent my whole life avoiding the people Jesus spent his whole life engaging. You want to know what love is? It's somebody who loves somebody that's unlovable. It's somebody that loves somebody that's difficult to love. The, the weird people, the kid sitting in the cafeteria at Bible college drawing comic books by himself who was in his Christian school with 30 people, didn't know how to talk to people his own age. And Kurt and Paul came over and talked to me. And nobody else at Bible school was talking to me. But Kurt and Paul did. I, was, I, I had a big beard. Sanders says, it's a good thing I met you the next year because I wouldn't have talked to you. I had zits all over my face. I would sit in the furthermost corner of the room away from the light so nobody could see all the, the massive zits. It was so bad. And I had big hair and this beard and I sat in the corner. I looked like I was 30 years old and I was 19. Right? And I sit in the corner like, because I was used to hiding. Plus my girlfriend had just dumped me after 18 months. And I was heartbroken. I was devastated. And my dad had kicked me out of Quinell and said, you're going to Bible school. I said, I don't want to go to Bible school. He says, get in the car. <laughs> right? And I'm down there all by myself. And Kurt and Paul came over and they showed me the love of God. They're the reason I'm a Christian because I was at Bible school and I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. And they showed me what that love was like. I, um, Christians go after the people that are the weirdest, the sickest, the most hard to love jerks. Sometimes Christians are the ones that show that unconditional love. And when we just, we, we just hang with people who are just like us and just nice and clean cut and easy to get along with, that's easy. Jesus said the pagans do that, people without God. Go and love somebody that's hard to love. And then you're starting to capture the heart of Jesus. Because those are the people he spent his time with. Interesting. First people he called, unschooled fisherman named Peter, with a big mouth, totally disorganized, totally unschooled. And he goes after a tax collector, the most hated people in the country, who, Jews that worked for the Roman government collecting taxes and they were notorious for collecting more than they needed to so they could line their own pockets. And everybody hated tax collectors. They were traitors. And Jesus goes up to Matthew in the middle of the day and he says, come follow me. And everybody's like, what is he doing? Those guys were the ones that became his followers and those 11 youth, most of them were unschooled, were the ones that changed the world with his love that he gave them. And they went and loved everybody around them. And we're here today because of those 11 unschooled rejects. One of them was so doubtful, and he became a disciple. And he's, he's credited with bringing the gospel to India first, Thomas. These are the people Jesus went after, and they got on his team. He didn't go after the educated. Paul reminded us of this. He said... Um, I mean, Luke reminded us of this. When Jesus was at a rich man's place for lunch one day, it was probably a great lunch, nice spread, Jesus turned to his host. When you put on a lunch or a banquet, don't invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, 
and your rich neighbors, for they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Right? Now, I'm sure if somebody that was um, crippled or lame or blind came to church, we would all love on them. But what about the person who is um, poor in manners? And they're obnoxious. And you got to put up with them every day. What about the crippled person who's stuck in their ways and they can't get unstuck from their lifestyle and they're, they're burning through friends quick? Will you be the friend that will still be their friend even if they can't get loose from the situation because they're so crippled they can't walk out of it? And they need Jesus through you to come and love them, to demonstrate him until they get him and then he heals them and they can get unstuck. That might take years right? But love is patient. Love never gives up, right? What about the blind person who just can't see anything of the truth of God? And they're just, they just don't get it. You're still their friend with no conditions, right? Paul wrote this, just remember you were once blind and lame and weak. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose the world, what the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they're wise. He chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one could ever boast in the presence of God. The people that think they've got it all together don't. They're pretending. Right? All the shiny, the shiny life on the surface, they might be the most, best looking people with, with money and education. And, and you know, they're, they're hurting inside just like everybody else. They're totally lonely. Right? And nobody can boast in God's presence because we're all needing grace. Right? He wants us to love people near us and the people we've kept far away. Who have you kept far away? Probably some of these coming to mind. I don't know who you've kept far away. You do. This is his clarion call to us this week to go and buy that person a cup of coffee. And to go maybe give them a hug. Or ask them to go to a movie with you. Those are the people he wants you to go and get. Because you were one of those that he went and got. There's a good question that was in the book, uh, Love Everybody Always, and it was this. Am I so insecure that I surround myself only with people who agree with me? Or am I confident enough in Christ that somebody could have a completely different worldview than me, a completely different political view than me, a completely different lifestyle to me that I find abhorrent naturally, and yet I go after them and I am their friend? That is a good question. Because if you're secure in Christ, then you know you're a son or daughter of the living God and you're full of His love and it doesn't matter if someone disagrees with me, it doesn't bug me, I'm still going to be your friend. Right? In the current climate of evangelical Christianity in North America, this is not true. We are insecure. They're digging trenches, not just a line in the sand. They're digging trenches to keep people out that have a different worldview than them. A lot of them. They're building walls. Jesus calls us to build bridges across the trenches so people can come to him. We have to rethink Christianity. Sometimes I don't want to call myself a Christian when I see what some Christians do in the news. I call myself a Christ follower now because don't lump me in with what they're saying or what they're doing or how they're acting or how they're talking. That is not Jesus. So it's asking this real question. Why do you want to love like Jesus? Well, one, it'll make you stronger because it'll make you more like Jesus. That's something that's good for you. You will get a thicker skin. You will have a bigger capacity to love with an energy and a power that is definitely the Spirit of God and not yourself. Right? It makes you stronger. And we get closer to Jesus when we get closer to messy people. Because they're the ones he chose to be close to. Remember Luke 15, how 
what prompted the three parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son. What prompted those famous stories was the first two verses where the religious people looked at Jesus and they saw him hanging out at dinner with the prostitutes and the drug dealers and the tax collectors. And he was hanging out with them and being their friends. And they were comfortable in his presence. And the Pharisees said, what is he doing hanging out with those kind of people? That's what prompted the three stories about what makes God happy is when the lost sheep is found, the lost coin is retrieved, and the lost son or daughter comes home. Powerful stuff. That's where the stories came from. So you can be closer to Jesus when you're closer, closer to the people that he's after because he's in their home with them right now. They're not here on Sunday morning. They're at home or in the coffee shop all alone. And maybe you should skip church one Sunday. Did I say that? Yeah. Because they're not ready to come here, but you're going to take them for breakfast on Sunday morning and talk to them for an hour. And then I don't care if you come in an hour late. But that's where he is right now. So you go get them. That's what love is. Jesus said, love your enemies. Are you kidding me? You want me to be nice to that guy? Hokey Dinah, Lord. That is really a big ask. This kid lost his temper at me and punched me at school. I went home and I complained to my dad about it. Dad said, good, invite him for dinner Friday. I said, what? You're supposed to be on my side. So I, you didn't say no to my dad, especially when I, when I was young and he was young. He was an Air Force Christian. He got saved in the Air Force. I went and asked Wayne to come for dinner and then youth group, and Wayne found Jesus and became a good friend of mine. Love your enemies. And he said, how, how do you do that? Matthew 5, 48, I think. He said, do good to them. Love, just don't agree with me to love your enemy. Go and do something good for your enemy. And then pray for them. And don't pray that God will smash their teeth. No imprecatory prayers. Okay? You could do that, you know, if they prove to be totally evil. But if they're just not like you, and so they're your enemy, smarten up and pray that they'll have joy in their life. And they will know that Jesus loves them through you. So do good to them. Pray for them. Pray for them that... Jesus says, pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. So the Christians are like, you mean that guy that whipped me? I'm in prison for being a Christian, and the guy that whipped me, my back to shreds with a cat and nine tails, you want me to pray for him? Paul did, and some of those captors got saved while he was in prison, being beaten and writing letters to the churches. They found Jesus, because Paul was good to them and prayed for them. That's really cool. And Jesus said, what you do to love them is bring the poor, the blind, and the lame to him. This is a, a, a photo from a movie uh, from a famous story when Jesus was here. One thing he did, this guy was lowered through Peter's roof. So there's so many crowds lined up to see Jesus out the door. They couldn't get into the house to see him. And these four friends brought their buddy who was quadriplegic, totally crippled, on a stretcher. And they climbed the roof of Peter's house and they tore through the roof. Can you imagine Peter going like, what are they doing to my house? And they lower this guy down into the middle of the living room where Jesus is. And Jesus sees this man as a quadriplegic. And the first thing he says to him is, I forgive you for your sin. Get up and walk. And the Pharisees were like, what's he doing forgiving that guy's sin? Only God can forgive sin. Ding, 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 ding. And, you know, and Jesus says, now get up and walk. And the guy gets up and walks. Jesus heals him. Just do what those four friends did. Bring your hurting people to Christ. Bring them to a Christmas Eve service. Bring them to Tim Hortons and buy them a coffee. Just bring them to Jesus. And then bring them to Jesus in prayer. Because when you pray, man, things happen. They, they happen when you bring them to Jesus. I can't change this guy's mind. Johnny's the jerk. Sorry, man, you sat there. <laughs> so I bring Johnny to Jesus. I say, I can't handle him. You're going to have to give me love to handle him. Jesus says, okay, let's do it together. And Jesus changes Johnny's heart. You've got to bring him to Christ. You can't raise the dead, 
who are dead in their sins. You can't open up the eyes of the blind so they see Jesus is the only way. Only he can do that. You can't unstop the, the ears of the deaf who are deaf to the call of his love. Only he can heal the deaf and the blind and the dead and the sick. Only him. So you've got to bring them to him. You can turn, this is some cautions, you can turn your right beliefs into a lie by how you communicate them. So don't be too pushy with the truth. Ask Jesus for the right windows. Remember, arguments don't change people. Only Jesus can. You can win an argument and lose a relationship. Not worth it. Only Jesus can change them. And you don't want to be somebody known for your opinions. You want to be somebody remembered for your love. I thought that was a good point. They'll remember that you love them. They won't remember your opinion. This is all talking about something that the world doesn't have on its own. It's called agape love, the Greek word for the love of God. In Greek, you got eros, the, the physical, sensual love. You got phileo, brotherly love. Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Well, that's what it's supposed to be. And um, you got all these different loves, right? But you've got agape love that can only come from God to your heart, to other people. It's the unconditional, self-sacrificing, selfless model of love that we found in Jesus. And that's the love the church is supposed to have. So it's agape love. It's not conditional upon whether you, there's church attendance or whether they agree with you theologically or have the same doctrinal beliefs as you. They, it's agape love. So my friend Mark, he's the Pentecostal youth pastor, 1995, brand new at the church. I'm brand new at the Baptist church. Um, I saw my dad. He was good friends, honest friends with the other pastors in town. I phoned Mark. I say, hey, we're both new to town. You want to have a coffee? He's like, why? And he's at the Pentecostal church, Baptist and Pentecostals, 30 years ago. I'm talking Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, right? And so Mark meets me for coffee, and he meets Kendall, the Alliance youth pastor. We, it was great. We were all brand new youth pastors. And we had a good coffee time. I said, you want to meet again next week? And Mark goes, whoa, that's a little much. I'm like, why would we want to do that? And I said, okay. So I phoned him up next week, and I said, you want to have coffee? He said, sure. So Mark and me and Kendall started hanging out so much that we decided just to combine our three youth events on Friday together. And then we had one epic youth group. We took turns speaking. We, we got resources together. Mark, he, we all had, I had a Tuesday night Bible study. Mark had a Wednesday night Bible study. Kendall had a Thursday night Bible study. And then Friday nights was a, a joint youth event. So the kids would church hop. And it's like, oh, how sad. Kids going to Bible study Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And Mark, if he was sick, I'd speak for him Wednesday night. If I was sick, I could get Mark over. Mark and Kim became such good friends that um, they were coming over for Christmas. We were honest friends, and we had these divides we grew up with of different denominations. And now... All the streams have become one river, and the Pentecostal churches of B.C. have let us use the hub free of charge for eight years, and they came by two weeks ago. And they said, we love what God's doing in your community. We're not going to replant our church. Keep using it for free. I mean, that is agape love, and that's the way it's supposed to be. It's not a competition. Somebody once told me, how's your competition? I'm like, what competition? The other churches? You mean my brothers and sisters? Right? Somebody would say to me when we started our church, so how are your numbers? What are the numbers of the other churches? I said, I don't know. I don't want to know what their numbers are. Because that's not what it's about. It's about 25 youth, 40 youth showing up and hearing about the love of Jesus. Then I buy the youth directors a latte because they deserve it when they do a good job like that. But that's what it's about. Love everybody always. It's about the cross. And today, when you come to Jesus, don't come thinking that he doesn't accept you the way you are today. Come and repent of your sin, say you're sorry, and just picture your sin going on the cross where it belongs, and then just take his love, and then go and love the people around you that way. Because this is what agape love is about, is the cross of Christ. The wrath of God poured out on Jesus against sin. Justice was meted out against Christ instead of you. You and I all deserve hell. Jesus took hell all of it on himself. And God is 100% not mad at you today because 100% of his wrath went on Jesus. So today, come to him as you are. 
get forgiven, and then go out and do the same for the people around you. Amen? Amen. Would you bow with me as the band comes up? Lord, we know that we have a tendency just to go for the people that are nice to us and kind, and I just pray that, Lord, you give us um, the love of Jesus that will conquer that tendency in us. Thank you that you came after me. And I pray, Lord, that as a church, we would go after the unlovable and the difficult and the freaks and the geeks. And we will go extend to them what you've given to us. We give you our lives. We give you our our weeks ahead. Guide us by love for you so we can love others. Jesus' name, all God people said. Stand up and sing this song.